About six months of our work and effort were invested into this project, and the results do speak for themselves. Effectively, what this device is, is it is one part of a big network of teleportation stations, where each one of them can teleport you to any of the other ones. For example, this would be station 1, this would be station 2, and this would be station 3. From station 1, you can teleport to 2, or 3, or 4 if it's somewhere in this world. In fact, there is no range limit. This one could be at the world border, and this one at spawn, and you could still teleport between them. How it is used is very simple. You have this address over here, which tells you what the number is that corresponds to this device. Down here, you input which device you want to teleport to. First, you must turn the device on so it can be teleported to. This takes a second, and then it will begin receiving the wireless value. To input an ender pearl after you have turned it on, you jump up here, you wait for the thing, and then you just hold down right click. Now we have ender pearls in there which will allow me to teleport back. To actually teleport, let's say I want to teleport to the world border, and hypothetically let's say that's the number 2 teleporter, I input the value here, which is already inputted, and I activate the transmitter. Then, if I want to, I can teleport, let's say, to that third one over there. And that's already inputted here. I just click this thingy, and because I already have Ender Pearls in there, I don't have to worry about it. And I can always come back. And boom. Now, if I want to, I can make a full loop and teleport back to the first original location where we previously input the Ender Pearls. How was this device actually developed? It all began with a deceptively simple concept. A one-way tellable stack separator, where the first portal triggers a tripwire which updates a dust, making it realize it's supposed to be off. This closes a fence gate and blocks the rest of the ender portals, the one that got through, dropping down and teleporting the player at that slice. The pearls are held in place by being placed in between normal flowing water and a bubble column. A problem arises. How do we input the pearls, making sure they're aligned precisely enough to work with our stack separator? These are two problems, really. For input to be viable, we could simply have the pearls drop down. But not only does this waste a lot of space, it almost entirely blocks off our access to the pearls. Additionally, if we're smart about it, there's a trick we could use to remove most of the pearl's velocity and compact this substantially. If the pearl enters a bubble column with a high speed, its speed will get capped and cut off. To utilize this, we have to input from below. We cannot input at an angle, so we use a precisely positioned tripwire to trigger the soul sand to slide out of the way. Importantly, it has to slide back before the water ticks to not remove the bubble column as if that happens, it will break the pearls hovering inside. This system was later refined into one tripwire and slider for the whole array, having the pearls slip through the moving blocks as the piston pushes them. Even this seemingly simple circuit has an extra layer of complexity to it. The dust that powers the initial piston is quickly redirected, the piston effectively depowering itself. Now, the neat thing here is, even after the blocks slide over and the torch powers the other side and it slid back, the piston does not activate, despite the dust having been redirected and the tripwire still being on. This functions as effectively as a rising edge detector via budding of the piston. Tackling the second problem, alignment, can be a bit trickier. We only really have access to the pearl from above, and even then we don't want to remove the water as it's important for vertical alignment. Many things were tried here, from having the pearls aligned on input, to various sliders, and even replacing the piston that pushes the pearls with a fence gate so that it misses any improperly aligned ones. We ended up going for a trapdoor slider design, where the water is first removed via a set of dispensers, the trapdoors are slid down, then side to side, returned, and the water is put back. With such a setup, we figure it is possible for the trapdoor to waterlog itself from an infinite water source, heavily simplifying the logic and making space. But there is a problem here. 
for that to happen, the trapdoor has to have a support block under it, which is obviously impossible. Or is it? As it happens, the piston we use to trigger the stack separator can be used as a sort of support block, if they're all activated. To make sure no pearls spill during this, we disable the butted dust in the stack separator. Now, a problem here is that without the water above the bubble column, the pearls can actually very rarely jump high enough to be pushed over the gate. To fix this, we pulse the pistons for only one tick, so that they ignore all entities. This, in turn, makes their timing much more precise. A tiny bit of rearranging later, we find ourselves with this design. This design works perfectly fine when fully wired. Players can input multiple pearls and eject one at a time with very low input precision. But there once again is a problem, one we had overlooked. When a stasis chamber is activated, the way the water deforms actually very, very slightly moves the other nearby ender pearls, which will over time misalign them. The alignment circuit can easily fix this, but it has to activate effectively before every time we dispense an ender pearl, because if we did it after, while the alignment would still be fine, any player input pearls before the activation would still get messed up. With this setup, doing alignment before is near impossible without adding a lot of complexity. Thankfully, we want to make this whole stasis array wirelessly connected to every other, which means we can simply include the fix to this problem in the integration between wireless and the stasis. Continuing, we include a wireless receiver above the chamber, leaving some space for further wiring. This receiver is 4-bit despite only needing 3 bits to decode for the 8 chambers. This serves a dual purpose. It is used as a protection from when multiple transmitters attempt to teleport to the same location. This bit activates only when exactly one person tries to teleport, but not when it's more than that. This bit also enables us to have a stasis chamber at index 0, because we can use it as the trigger to the whole system. To make it fit in a 5 watt area, one of the segments of the receiver is shifted. The receiver slightly hangs over the backside of the device, as we fit a red coder under it. Additionally, this receiver uses a block event delay prefix as opposed to a tile tick based one because this makes it effectively immune to noise. The three bits are converted to a hexadecimal signal strength and above that circuit we fit our receiver clock. The clock of course has to connect to the back of the receiver and between them we have to fit a channel selector that will offset the timings of the device between 1 and 15 game ticks of additional delay. The problem? We don't have a design that does that, at least not nearly compact enough for it to be practical. The solution? Theft! Okay, okay, not really, we asked for permission. Nothing but luck, a member of the Kronos server had made a design for a circuit that does exactly this for one of his projects. Taking it apart, effectively all it does is convert the signal to a specific signal strength to get that channel, then sends that signal into a comparator decay loop, decaying at two signal strength every second tick. In the final cycle, the circuit determines if there's one or two left signal strength, and based on this either triggers the circuit one game tick earlier or later. Altogether, the signal strength directly translates to a game tick delay to receiving a pulse. To illustrate how precisely this is fit in, see this comparator? It used to be a repeater. If it's a repeater, the signal gets through with too high of a priority, and that basically leads to the signal leading up to the repeater, updating the pistons and messing up their order. But we did eventually manage to fit it in and make it properly connect to the receiver. The next step was to put in a circuit that will save the section we want to activate, then trigger the alignment, and after that trigger the segment clearing a memory cell. This is done with signal strength and a comparator loop at the front. The cell's output is constantly fed into the decoder, but it's locked by a torch. This torch is activated at the same time as the memory cell is cleared via a signal pulled off of the line that triggers all of the pistons to refill the water, and is rather precisely timed. Then we added a toggle to either turn the device on or off. Additionally, we lock the input of the ender pearls while the device is active, as things can break if a player inputs as it's activated. To temporarily deactivate the device and input ender pearls, we take the trigger of the tripwire and hook it up as well as add a bell sound so that the player can jump into it and begin inputting after having heard the ding. All that's left on the receiver end is to add reload protection, which we do in two spots. On the top, we add these pistons, which fixes a rare bug where these sliders will get set in the wrong state on reload and we add a reload detector that disables the whole stasis for a few seconds after reload, neatly fit above the top pistons in the stasis. 
Now, obviously, every receiver also needs a transmitter, and for ease of use, we decided to fit ours underneath the receiver. One tiny problem with that. How do we fit in a clock without going out of footprint? See, not only do we need a daylight sensor with only transparent blocks above it, some types of blocks are disqualified entirely, such as observers, as they do actually block skylight access for daylight sensors. For you, this is a quick 5 second problem. See this? We fit it right here. For us, this problem took multiple days of work. Above and around that daylight sensor, we squeeze a compact piston-based lookup table to convert the individual segment inputs to the binary code that represents that position. With relative ease, we then wired a channel selector and properly timed everything, connecting it back into a set of transmission droppers and resetting the decoder. This is where we run into a problem. If the user triggers more than one segment of the decoder before the device activates, it pushes these bottom pistons out of the way. The solution to this problem ended up being rather simple. Simply have the pistons that push back the decoder pushed out of the way by default and pull them back when they're ready to activate. Having worked out all of the kinks and having made a successful teleportation network, the only thing left to do was to release it and to make an epic montage. Thank <laughs> you.